Hey there, thank you for joining us. Whether you're online or you're here on our campus, I just wanna take a few moments and, and let you know about a few things going on here at Open Door Baptist Church. Of course, today is Graduate Sunday, so in just a little while, we're gonna be honoring our graduates in our service. And so I wanna say congratulations to the class of 2022. Also today was Promotion Sunday. So in our Sunday School small group time this morning, we had several classes that promoted to a new class. And so if you have any questions about that, you can see me following the service or contact our church office and we can get you plugged in into the correct Bible study group on Sunday mornings. Do want to remind you that this week on Wednesday, we're going to have our midweek service here in the auditorium. We have Olympians and it'll be our last Wednesday night of Olympians and our open door teens upstairs. At the beginning of our Wednesday night study, we're going to take a few moments and honor some of the Olympian uh, children uh, with some awards and some of their accomplishments this year. So that's Wednesday night at seven o'clock. And then a week from Wednesday on June 1st, we begin our Wow Wednesday series. We're excited excited about this multi-generational worship service, have a lot of activities, Bible challenges from different leaders within our church. So if you can be a part of it, I know you that you'll enjoy it. And then also I do want to remind you too, to take some time and go to summer.odbc-church.com. There you can find out information about Vacation Bible School, our music camp this summer, teen camp, and our, our Freedom Sunday. So there's a lot going on this summer and we want you to be a part of it. Again, summerodbc church Church.com. Well, in a moment, we're going to begin our service again. Thank you for worshiping with us today. This Wednesday night is our final Olympian meeting of the year. Our uh, students will be receiving their awards for all of their hard work this year. They'll actually be doing that in the main Wednesday night Bible study. So parents, you can come and enjoy watching your children get their awards. And then afterwards, we'll take the kids out and they will get their final store of the year. And we will close out this year of Olympians. So we're looking forward to this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Good morning. Just a few announcements for Open Door Teens. This Wednesday is our final Wednesday service for the teens uh, before next school year. Uh, so make sure that you plan to come celebrate that summer is here and you will not want to miss this service. Uh, look forward to seeing you there. Next Sunday, we have a smack, a Sunday morning after church. We'll be going over to Lit Pizza on Jubin. So make sure you plan to come and have some fellowship after Sunday morning service next week. Well, good morning. Good to see you in the house of God. Would you stand to your feet? Let's open this morning with come. Now's the time to worship.
but it's a great opportunity to start the week praising and glorifying Christ together. And I trust that you've already begun to do that today as we start to think about those songs that we just sung. Uh, now is the time to worship. And by the way, every moment is a time to worship Christ, is it not? And then we start to think about that song that we just sang, Come Thou Fount. And I trust that your heart is warmed by the presence of Christ and excited to be able to praise him today. And let's make sure that our hearts are in the right spot as we pray and trust that Christ would speak to us and encourage us uh, from his 
his word today. It's an exciting day. Uh, we're going to have a baptism in just a few moments, and then in a little bit we're going to honor our graduates as well, and just a special, special day that we have today, and it's kind of like just before summertime starts. I know it's, the weather's felt a lot like summer, hasn't it? Uh, but just a great opportunity to be able to worship together, to celebrate the things that God is doing uh, in people's lives, and I want to thank you for taking the opportunity uh, to be with us here, or for those who are online, thank you very much for watching online as well. Uh, great opportunity to be able to grow together, and I hope that uh, you'll just uh, communicate and share Christ's love with each other today uh, as we worship him this morning. If you would, Brother Caleb, if you would come and uh, lead us in a word of prayer, uh, and then we will have our baptism today. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We uh, thank you for all the many blessings that you blessed us with, Lord. Uh, I pray now that you would just continue to watch over and protect us, Lord. I pray that you would uh, just give us Give Pastor the words to say that you would just watch over him, protect him, Lord. I pray that you would just open our hearts and our minds to you, Lord, that you would just fill us today. And I pray that if uh, there's someone here that doesn't know you, that you would uh, work in their life, Lord. And uh, thank you again for all the blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. The opportunity of having another baptism this morning. Rasheen comes this morning, and uh, she's up in the baptistry right there. Rasheen, good to see you. And uh, Brother Ben's going to baptize her in just a moment. Just want to remind you that the step that she's taking right now is not going to save her. She already knows Jesus as her Savior. She's on her way to heaven. And uh, that's true for anybody who trusts in Jesus Christ. And this morning she wanted to make that decision public to you uh, by getting baptized today. Amen.
speak the holy name Jesus Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name It's biblical. See that right there, just a reminder that so many times it, it takes so much work. And so you wonder why, like, you get so tired when it came to all your studies and everything that go on. And it's because much study is weirdness of the flesh. Uh, I think there's another reminder, too, when it comes to graduating, you know, when you're finally able to take your tassel and move it from one side to the other and to be able to throw your cap into the, the air, right? And to be able to do that, so reflective of this idea, the Bible also says that better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. To be able to celebrate what it is that God has done 
in your life. And I know that certainly you've been able to celebrate uh, as well. And so this morning, we have a couple of gifts that we'd like to give to you. And uh, Abigail, we have this for you as well. And uh, I'm thankful for Abigail. And she's planning on teaching here uh, at our school this next year. So everybody wave to hi to Abigail as well. And uh, you'll see more of her around uh, as, uh, when, as time goes on uh, this, uh, as we go through the school year. And then Rachel, I'm going to give this gift to you as well. And uh, Braden, for you too. And when it comes to them, uh, we can think of nothing better to give to our high school graduates than a copy of God's Word. Amen. And uh, when it comes to going to college, when it comes to going to their classes and all the things that they have to go forward, uh, we will encourage you to carry the Word of God with you, both in your heart and in your hand, to be able to show people of your faith in Christ. And Abigail, we expect that by now you have a Bible, having graduated from Bible college, <laughs> and uh, I know they have a Bible as well. Um, but uh, we just want to be, so you have a gift card uh, in there. You can spend it on whatever you want to, okay? So if you want to buy another Bible, you can uh, as far as that. But we're thankful for our graduates. And this morning, would you just please pray with me? Any, any other graduates here this morning? We want to recognize you, okay? Just run up here and we'll say, great, uh, as far as that. But glad to have you here with us this morning. And you know, let's have a word of prayer and ask God to bless our graduates this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for the work that you've done in these graduating seniors' lives. As they continue to commence and to do the work that you've laid before them, uh, we ask that you would provide, that you would guide, that you would take care of each and every step and help them to follow your will. Lord, I ask that you would help them to continually turn to the word of God. We thank you for their testimonies of knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior. Uh, we thank you for what you have done already in their lives, and we ask that you would bless them. Lord, we ask as a church family that you would help them to be encouraged in their walk with you, and that you would uh, certainly help us to encourage them and to certainly uh, just cheer them on as they take these steps, some of them into these early steps of adulthood and opportunities that you have for them. We ask that you would bless and whether it's teaching in a school, uh, whether it is going to college, whether it comes to studying, whatever those studies may be, would help us to reflect upon you, to understand that you are the uh, chief study of our hearts and our lives. We ask that you would bless this day, bless these seniors. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Would you give them a round of applause as they're seated this morning? Amen. Well, let's do this right now. Um, I was thinking this is kind of a perfect Sunday, Graduate Sunday. It's also Promotion Sunday. So today is the first day. We have some kindergarten graduates in here. Can y'all wave at me, kindergarten graduates? If you graduate from kindergarten, oh, there's one back there, one right there, one back there. Because oh, there's one right there. Because this is their first Sunday. They, they get to go to King's Kids, to Kids Church. Mm -hmm. And so, yes. So first through sixth graders, that means those kindergarten graduates, y'all can head back to the back. Of course, parents, you're welcome to, to slip back with them if, if, if they uh, want to see what goes on there. But I think most of them are all good. They just said, <laughs> bye, see ya. <laughs> um, but would you stand? Let's sing one more time. There's a place. Where mercy reigns and never dies. And there's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all
that you just continue to work. It's been great to see uh, those that have surrendered their life and, and publicly made known their faith in baptism this morning to celebrate the accomplishments of graduates, knowing that it, you receive the glory and honor for that. And Lord, I pray as we continue to worship you this morning, uh, Lord, that we'll, uh, that we'll look to you, we'll allow you to speak to our hearts and lives, Lord, that you'll remove distractions out of the way, and Lord, that you'll meet with us in a mighty way this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. From broken dreams and wasted years And tell the past to disappear Oh, let me tell you about my Jesus And all the wrong turns that you would Go and undo if you could Who can work it all for your good Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way when there ain't no way Rises up from an empty Love 
is strong and his grace is free and the good news is i know that he can do for you what he's done for me let me tell you about my jesus and let my take my cross to calvary pay the price for all my guilty who would care that much about me let me tell you about my jesus oh he makes a way when there ain't no way rises up from an empty Jesus comes in, everything's different. Amen. If you would open your Bibles to do the book of Deuteronomy chapter number two is where we're going to be uh, this morning. We've been talking about doing difficult things and how to develop a resilient life as a disciple, which is a follower of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to ask you this question this morning. Uh, when it comes to your life, are you stuck? Are you stuck? Are there parts of your life that perhaps you know are in a rut? or in some type of a place where it's just simply not going anywhere. Well, we start to think about that today, and we're going to be talking about this today, unsticking your faith, unsticking your faith. Uh, one of my earlier years here at Open Door, uh, some of you may remember um, uh, that we used to have a tractor in the barn. You all remember that? Some of you may remember. There's an old Ford tractor and I had a blown head gasket. And there was one of these days that I just kind of on a whim, I was kind of thought, I'm going to try to be a farmer. And so I went out to the barn and I got the, the tractor and this northern part of our piece of property over here is kind of long. So I thought, you know, I'm going to get the bush hog and I'm going to go out there. I'm going to try to cut the grass uh, that was out there. And uh, if you've been out there from a distance, you may not know, but it's kind of rough. And for those of you who cut the grass out there, uh, you know it's a little bit more rough uh, out that spot. But uh, I thought, you know, I'll get on the tractor. I'm going to have a little bit of fun. And uh, I needed some prayer time anyway. And uh, if you drive a tractor that has a blown head gasket, you'll pray too. And, um, you know, so it used more water than it used diesel fuel. So uh, every couple of passes that I would make across the way, I'd pull back into the barn, fill it up back with water. Water, go back out, use the bush hog, and uh, as I got closer to the uh, the ditch uh, or the canal that's out there, um, there are these places. A few years ago, kind of dug it out. There's a couple of places where uh, there's some place where the water runs off into the canal, and uh, so I was out there with the tractor, and guess what happened? As I'm rolling along, I wasn't rolling anymore. Here I was going at one point in time, e -I -E -I -E, and I was just being, you know, a farmer, and uh, all of a sudden, I went E-I-E-I-O, -E -I -E -I and my wheel just kept on spinning and turning, and, you know, when you have a big wheel like that, you're like, what am I supposed to do? And obviously, I am not a farmer, so I was trying to figure out what am I supposed to do, how do I get this tractor unstuck? Because I think you know that if you keep on turning wheels, it just makes things worse. It doesn't actually make things better. Uh, and so I had to figure out how to get that tractor out. Well, guess what? I had that problem, and getting a tractor out of a muddy rut changed the direction of my prayer life that day, right? And uh, so, Lord, what do I do now? That was kind of my prayer, and I needed to get that tractor unstuck. Well, a rut, think about a rut. That's kind of where I was. A rut means that 
without some help or doing something different, you're not going to go anywhere. Another person described a rut as a grave with two ends kicked out. The Israelites, as we are going to see here in the book of Deuteronomy, had disobeyed God, and so they traveled for 40 years in the desert. Our text is going to describe those final days of waiting for the first generation to die and a new generation to be able to inherit the promised land. Hopefully you've found the book of Deuteronomy and uh, chapter number two by now. In case you haven't, uh, there is a Bible. There should be a Bible in one of the chairs around you. If you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, I'll encourage you to open that up. In the book of Deuteronomy, there's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible there in the very front. And Deuteronomy chapter number two, if you would stand with me this morning, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter number two. I'm going to read a few verses that surround this passage as well. And again, I hope that this will be a blessing to you and encourage when it comes to unsticking our faith. The Bible says this, Deuteronomy chapter number two, beginning verse number one. Then we turned, Moses is writing, and took our journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, as the mount, as the Lord spake unto me, and we compassed Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Then he says these words, Turn you northward. Turn the page there in your Bible. A little bit of context in Deuteronomy 3 and note verse number 18. He says, And I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God hath given you this land to possess it. Ye shall pass over armed before your brethren, the children of Israel, all that are meet for the Lord. Verse number 28, chapter 3 says, But charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. And then chapter number four, verses one and two say, now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Ye shall not add unto the words which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, this morning, our prayer is that you would help us to follow you. Our prayer this morning is that you would help us to trust you and follow you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We look at the Word of God this morning, and here's my proposition. Uh, we've been talking about doing some of these difficult things, and here's the difficult thing I want to encourage you to do is, is that of unsticking your faith and following God. So consider where your faith is stuck, where your faith is not moving. The fact is, is that Satan likes stuck Christians. A little secret in my life is I do not like sticky things, okay? Just a little thing, and I have not told you many, many of you people about this uh, because I'm fearful of what you might do knowing that secret, okay? Um, there have been times my family has threatened me uh, with sticky things in life uh, when it comes to that, so uh, you're, I love you, and I hope that you love me, and you'll keep sticky things away from me, okay, uh, when it comes to that. But uh, not too long ago, I was uh, cleaning something actually uh, over one of our facilities and reached up into the ceiling and guess what I found? I found, okay, sticky things are one thing, but how many of you have ever like put your hand or your foot in what those like sticky rodent traps, you know what I'm talking about? So I like reached into the ceiling trying to work on something all of a sudden, doosh. like no. Cause you know what it feels like, right? How many of you have ever done that? Like you, you stepped in one or you put your hand in one and then you're like, right? And so my hand moves so fast because in my mind, I'm thinking this is a trap. It was probably there for rodents or something like that. Who else knows what is in that trap besides my hand, right? And so it wasn't just the sticky that bothered me, but the fact is this, when it comes to sticky, I don't like sticky. The fact is too, when you get stuck, you ever got stuck on the side of a road, flat tire, run out of gas. Oh, just be honest. How many of you have ever run out of gas? Just a quick survey. Wow, a bunch of you have. Okay, good. Okay, now let's be honest. How many of you did it because the gas gauge didn't work? Just uh, let's be serious. Because the gas gauge doesn't work. Okay, a little bit more excuse if the gas gauge doesn't work. Okay, how many of you just 
We're trying to figure out how far your car was going to go before you had to get gas, okay? okay a bunch of you, so more of you raised your hands on that one. Uh, quite, quite interesting to be able to see uh, as far as that. But when it comes to getting stuck, the, I do know this, Satan likes stuck Christians. We start to think about being stuck. God doesn't want us to be stuck. Perhaps you've been praying for God to do something, and sometimes it seems like there are no answers. Maybe you know relationships or frustrating things that you've long since learned to ignore because they just haven't changed in life. You may remember some things that God spoke to you about changing in your life, but they seem too hard. So maybe you've ignored them and you just pushed them off for a longer period of time. The fact is, is that we need help getting our faith moving in the right direction again. Our text this morning, and I'm going to keep referring to Deuteronomy 2 and verse number 3, it reminds us of these words. He's, God says, you have come past this mountain long enough, turn you northward. God's reminding us that you've been here, you've been stuck, you've been in this same spot way too long. It's time to start moving again. So this morning, I just want to share with you a few thoughts about how we know when it's time or how we know that we are really ready to start moving and following God again. So in the first place, we know that we're ready to get our faith unstuck when we are done spinning our wheels. I alluded to that uh, illustration just a few moments ago when it came to riding the tractor and guess what? Uh, okay, here's another illustration. You've got your, ever get your tires stuck in a mud somewhere? If you've been up north when it snowed. Anybody ever get your car stuck in the snow? I, I am thinking about a half dozen illustrations right now, but they're all embarrassing, so I won't share them with you at this moment. Uh, but we start to think about getting stuck in a rut, and we are tempted to keep on trying to get out, right? You ever done that? So you're like, okay, I'm stuck in a rut, so what do we do? We just, well, we step on the gas pedal, if it's our car, and we keep on spinning those wheels, which, what does that do? It just throws more mud uh, sometimes intentionally in up north, I have intentionally gotten my tires in the snow uh, towards somebody and stepped on the gas and threw snow on them. It's kind of a fun thing to be able to do, right? Uh, but you start to think about getting stuck in, a rut, stuck in a rut, and that is a difficult thing to get out of. You ever tried and tried and tried to do something, but you don't make any progress? Or perhaps the results don't turn out the way that you thought that they would. Well, maybe you want to evaluate if God has for you to go that way. Israel had a history of trying to do her own thing. We have to wonder, why was Israel still wandering in the desert when that was not God's original intent? Here they are, probably 38, 39 years into their 40-year wilderness wandering. I want you to remember, God brought the Israelites out of Egypt. They were in Egypt for over 400 years. How many of you say 400 years is a long time, right? So here they are. God leads them out. They're finally set free from Pharaoh. And God leads them through the desert. It really only took a few months from Egypt to the promised land. God wants them to go in. And all of a sudden, God says, hey, send some spies into the land to see how good it is. And God's, uh, Israel sends some spies into the land. Guess what happens? You remember the story? Ten were bad and two were good, right? Okay, so two good, good guys were who? Joshua and Caleb. Everybody else, they had a bad report. They're like, hey, it's a good land, but we can't, we, we can't win. There's too many giants. There's too many walled cities in the land. We can't, we can't win. And so they caused a ruckus. And guess what? Because of the Israelites, they listened to these words of the 10 spies, and the spies said that they couldn't win. So instead of faith, guess what happened? Well, you guessed it. They raised the stink they got mad at God and Moses for leading them out of slavery into the desert, leading them all this way. They listened to the lies of fear, and they became foolish. And the truth became prey to emotions. Then when God told them that because of their sin, they would not be able to enter the promised land, but their children would, guess what those people did? Do you remember what they did? If you go back to the story, here's what the Israelites did. God says, okay, because of your disobedience, because of your, you don't have faith, and you said you're not going to go into the promised land, God said, okay, you're not going to go into the promised land. And then all of a sudden, they like flipped on a dime, like, well, we want to go into the promised land. And so they gathered an army, 
And God said, you can try, but you're not going to win. And guess what? That army tried to go into the promised land, and guess what happened? They were defeated, and they turned around and came back. You can see that Israel was really, really hard-headed, and they tried to keep on doing things their own way. They kept on spinning their wheels. They would go conquer the promised land, they thought, in their own way. Israel was stuck in a rut, spinning her wheels, in lacking discernment, making bad decisions, and trying to do things in their own strength. Friends, we need to be honest. How many of us have tried to ask God to, maybe you don't use these words, but to bless this mess that we are setting out to do instead of letting God help us with his wisdom? It's a tragedy that plays out way too often. The Bible and life is full of examples of people who, keep, who kept on kicking against the pricks, who still wondered why their lives were not experiencing God's blessings. Well, one little hint for you is found in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. When it comes to our lives, we need to be a people who love the Word of God, who are done spinning our wheels and we're prepared to do things God's way. Deuteronomy 2, 3 says this, ye have come past this mountain long enough. He says, turn you northward. Well, perhaps if you've not been spinning your wheels, maybe you are another type of stuck. And so let me kind of show you number two this morning from our passage We know that we are ready to get our faith unstuck when we are done giving up. You ever just given up? I believe this, that after the Israelites, many of them, after they tried to do things and they tried to accomplish things and God said nothing doing, uh, where he told them simply, you're going to, instead of going into the promised land, for the next 40 years, you're going to travel in the wilderness. And by the way, all of you who are like military age and older, You're never going to go into the promised land. Your kids are, but you're not. How many of you might just want to give up? Now, God still had some things for his people, but many of them start to give up. When we are stuck in a rut, we are tempted to not do anything. The Israelites were pretty much in a holding pattern outside of the promised land. They could not go into the promised land because God rejected that first generation. And if you were told that the consequences of your sin would keep you from being able to participate in something great that God was going to do, how would you respond? I think many of us would certainly lose heart and think it's worthless to serve God. Many people feel like recovering from a failure of some sort is just way too difficult. They may become discouraged. How might we feel? Sometimes we have a fear of failing again. You ever felt that way before? I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. I've been trying to walk with God. You just feel like you're going to fail again if you just try one more time. Sometimes in our lives we fear or we feel as if that God is angry with us. And the Israelites could have felt that way as well when uh, they tried to buck against the, God's will. And they tried to do their own thing. And, and God said, hey, you, you can't go into the promised land. They started to give up. Why? Because oftentimes they felt as if God was angry with them. Sometimes when the world looks like it's getting so bad, we wonder, what is even the use of trying? And let's add to the scenario that many of us, of us have been taught about, quote, unquote, the perfect will of God. This morning, we talked about some of our graduates, and when it comes to our graduates graduating and commencing life, we pray that they would continue to take steps to walk in God's will. But let me ask you a question. Has there anybody here ever accomplished fully every day God's quote-unquote perfect will of God for their life? No, not a one of us. So we have to wonder Is it worth it? The best thing ever is when we come to know God. And God's will is so richly stated in 2 Peter 3.9. He he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count uh, slackness, but God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
God's perfect will is clearly identified in Scripture, is it not? God desires for each and every one of us to know him. So God's will then is for you to be saved. And then does he does his purifying, sanctifying work in our lives. But we still have choices. We all face choices, right? We have a lot of choices in life. Sometimes we've heard sermons that say, if you don't share Christ and live for him, then you are dooming others to hell. You ever heard a sermon like that? I've heard sermons, lots of sermons like that. Let me remind you, friends, yes, if God wants you to do something, you are accountable for your actions. But let's be truthful and know that God's will never stops with us because of our obedience or our disobedience. Romans reminds us that all are guilty. It also reminds us that God is revealed to the entire world. Let me remind you too, if you can go back to some of the Bible stories, think of the story of Esther who was fearful of approaching the king to save her people. Her cousin Mordecai said these powerful words in Esther 4.14, and you probably know them well. For if thou, speaking to Esther, altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews. How? From another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? We think of Deborah and Barak. Barak was afraid to go on his own to the battle. So God said, instead of him having victory, guess what? Victory was not going to come through him, but victory was going to come through a woman. God delights in using, yes, us, yes, but in part because he delights in using little and weak things to prove it is his work and not ours. We remember how it was that God reduced the number of Gideon's army in Judges 7, 2. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine own hand has saved me. Let us remember 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Let us remember that in our choices, we choose to participate or not to participate in God's will, and then to discover or not the eternal rewards that he has for his children. In this way, there are no great men or women. No, there are only great opportunities that God presents to us in his will. In a day, Deuteronomy 2, when Israel had given up following God, God showed himself, he reminds us later on that God would show himself to Isaiah. And after that great vision on Isaiah 6, God knew that when his servant's faith was bolstered, what Isaiah's response was going to be, when God called him. What did he say? Here am I, send me. A question is, how many opportunities will you see in God's will to take and to do? Too often we say that when we see a need, somebody needs to do such and such. You ever said that before? You ever see a problem? Somebody needs to take out the garbage. I hear that a lot, right? Somebody needs to take out the garbage. Somebody needs to pick this up. Somebody needs to do this. Somebody needs to do that. The fact is this, somebody needs to do it, but somebody's pretty ethereal. Like who's going nebulous? Who's going to get it? Who's going to do it? Will you be like the Israelites who spent their time moaning in the wilderness, pining of their time away? Or will you be like Ezekiel in Ezekiel 22, 30? And God says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. And here was God's testimony. I found none. But we understand it was a sad time in Israel's history, but Ezekiel still preached the word of God. So let's get busy for God. Let's move for God. Not giving up, but claiming our community for Christ and standing in the gap on behalf of those around us. How? Sharing Christ and standing in the gap for others to invite them to follow Christ with us. Deuteronomy 2, 3. You can pass this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. A final thought this morning is this. Number three, we know we are ready to get our faith unstuck when we're ready to move. 
when we're ready to move. You know how it was in the land of, uh, the, as the Israelites were approaching the, the promised land for 40 years, God led them, a pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire. And guess what? How, this is how it worked. When God picked up and moved, the Israelites picked up and moved, right? You can imagine living that way. When God parked, guess what they did? They parked for a period of time. But we can start to see here that they were in this part of this, this land before they went into the promised land for a long period of time. And at some point, you need to decide if you're going to allow your life to be motivate, motivated by the right thing. The Israelites had given up, and now a new generation was following in their heels. For almost 40 years, Israel traveled around and around and around in the wilderness. I've often wondered why it was that God kept on moving the Israelites around for those 40 years. Here's a very short answer. Because God kept on stirring their faith. God wanted something to be different. And sometimes that came along with a change of scenery and location. I think if they stopped moving, then the people would get comfortable where they were. In fact, if they stayed in one spot too long, they might even start to build and to settle where they were. God does not want us to build and settle in Doubting Abby. Did you like what I did there? When it comes to our lives, we need to continue to walk with him. Although the Israelites had disobeyed God, he wanted to still give the existing generation and the generation to follow what? Faith exercises to build their trust in him. For those who could watch and listen to him. God did not want his people to get stagnant and comfortable where they were way too long, did he? God had some change. God had some things that he was doing. And this is the same for us today as well. Why does God keep allowing change to happen in my life? You ever ask the question, why can't things just be the same? You ever felt that way before? Like there's a new operating system, there's a new phone that comes out, uh, the cellular, cellular company tells you you need to change your phone because your phone's not going to be supported anymore. Like there's new Windows versions and new Macintoshes, there's new cars. I mean, just the technology is one area of life. When it comes to different laws and things that change our lives, the people who are in our lives, the people who come in and out of our lives. And, and understand, God gets it. We enjoy it when we finally get into a rhythm and a routine that seems to work. You ever done that before? Like, okay, this is the year. You ever said that? This is the year. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to accomplish this stuff. I've got my new rhythm. I've gotten to my new groove. This is going to work this year. We like the people around us. They like us too. And we make the place where we are just like home. And then change happens. Some of those people move elsewhere where God moves them up to heaven and we start to feel alone again. Then sometimes we are called to move or because the people around us have changed, home just doesn't feel like home anymore. Why? I like to illustrate it. How many of you like food illustrations? Those are all, always bad illustrations to use before lunchtime, right? So, I'll, I'll say this one quick. I'm going to make you hungry, and the, the restaurant you go to will, will thank me for it later, okay? You ever use, uh, cook something on the stove or a burner, and you forgot about it, right? So something's cooking on the stove, or maybe you're making a big pot of jambalaya. Never done it, but I've watched other people do it, and uh, you kind of forget to stir it. What happens to the stuff at the bottom? Okay, since I'm in a survey mood today, how many of you have ever done this and you've said something like this to somebody? When you get your stuff out of the pot, don't scoop down to the bottom. You know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, why? Because the stuff at the bottom probably got burned. How many of you like to eat burned stuff? Why? Because it wasn't stirred. Because it wasn't mixed. The Apostle Paul wrote to help Timothy because Timothy was in the ministry, and ministry at times feels like you're in a pot being cooked. I'll just be honest. And if you are not careful, you can get burned because Timothy was fearful because of the problems of ministry. And so the Apostle Paul wrote this in 2 Timothy 1, verses 6 through 9. He says, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou do what? Stir up the gift of 
of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He says, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. God allows change in your life because your life needs stirring up. You are ready to get unstuck when you are prepared and ready to move. Here's a couple of thoughts. If we're ready to move, there's a couple of things we're gonna do. First of all, we're gonna rely on God's word. Rely on God's word. We think the Bible is sometimes just a book that never changes, and that's partially true. Its words may not change, but its words change us. The Bible is a living book, and each time you read it, it has the power to make you different and to make you better. Which, by the way, one of the reasons why we should all read the Bible. One of the reasons why our nation and the word of this world needs the Bible is because the Bible makes us to be better citizens and people of this earth and better citizens of heaven as well. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God, the Bible, is quick. That means it's alive. It is powerful. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So, do you want something to stick to? Stick to God's word. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 31, I, I like how he says this, not that I like sticky things, but we should stick to the word of God. I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord, put me not to shame. Another thing that we need to do is we need to run to God's presence. If you are ready to move, run to God's presence. And in this, all I can say is this, relinquish your hold on what is comfortable. Relinquish your hold on what is comfortable. Sometimes we get comfortable. Some of you sit in the same chairs when you come to church. Some of you park in the same parking spot. Some of you get the same cup of coffee every day. Every once in a while, it's good to mix things up, right? Right? In our lives, we need to let God change things. If there's one thing I like to prize myself about is that oftentimes I like to try to figure things out. How many of you are like that too? You like to try to figure figure things out, right? You like to reason through things. Uh, Oftentimes, my system of doing things is try to exhaust all the options and then to decide what's best. Okay, some of you may do the same thing. Some of you don't. We're all a little bit different. To each his own, I guess. The problem is that one, that can take a long time, but more importantly, is that it can also throw out faith. You ever try to reason through something so much that like, oh, this is just the obvious answer and you don't even have to have faith about it? Sometimes that's an easy thing to be able to do. More often than not, I've had to stop and wait. How many of us like to wait? None of us do. None of us like to be patient. We want answers now. We want things to happen right now. So the best thing to do is to wait on God. Watch where God moves. And by the way, I've had to do this many, many different times. Watch where God moves in order to be able to direct our church where it is that God has for us. This takes time, but it's the right thing to be able to do. The word of God says in James 4, 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. He says, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. And then he says these words, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. We need to let God lift us up. We need to let God direct us in our lives. We need to run into God's presence because being with God is the best place to be so you know what to do and how to do it and with whom to do it. Otherwise, enjoy your time just being with him, just being with God. When's the last time you've done that? Because when it comes to spending time with God, God helps us to know how it is that we ought to move. Remember, Remember that nothing can separate you from God's love. No matter what good or bad seems to come your way, God will lead, your, lead you through it. You can go with him because it is really the best choice. Many times we choose other things in life. Let's follow him. And I believe that when we get to this point that we're ready to do two things, these things aren't on the screen, but I'll just mention it quickly. We're ready to teach a new generation how to go farther than we did. 
I believe that when we are ready to move, we are ready to teach a new generation how to go farther than we did. How do we know that? Because in Deuteronomy 2, the old generation, basically they're just camping out until the last few people died from the previous generation. It's a waiting game. And hopefully the previous generation had invested into that next succeeding generation that was coming up so that they would be prepared, as God wanted them to, to what? Go into the promised land and to conquer the promised land and to live in the promised land. We know we are ready to move when it's not all about me. We have a tendency to like to do kingdom building, to have our own houses, to have our own stuff, to have all these toys for us. Hey, it's not all about us, but it's about investing for the future. Amen? Sometimes we get really short-sighted about that. A few weeks ago, we talked about that. Suffer, allow the little children to come unto me. That's an investment in the future. Here's another thought. We know about this. When we finally get to this point, we know we're here because we are ready to let go of the past for a better future. Interestingly and oddly enough, some of the Jewish people, the Israelites, said it was better for us when we were slaves in Egypt. What? Did they forget what it was like to make bricks without straw? When Pharaoh doubled the order, when they were working in the hot sun, God had led them to the promised land. It was going to be better. And by the way, we need to be ready to let go of the successes that even we've had in the past so we can look forward to a better future. We are always as Christians looking ahead. Philippians 3, 8, the apostle Paul writes, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. Lovely word to say in church, right? I count them as dung that I may win Christ. Wow. The apostle Paul had many successes, many great things that God led him to be able to do. But he says, hey, I don't hold on to those things in the past. Praise the Lord for the glory days that some churches have may have had in the past, but understand that God wants to live, God wants to breathe, God wants to use, God wants to fill, God wants to encourage, God wants to work in your life today. Sometimes we have a tendency to hold people back from what God wants to do in their life today because everything in the past used to be so good. Was it really? Hold on a second, folks. Understand that today's day and today's time is a time that we march forward and we encourage each other to have our best days ahead. And if ultimately understand our best days still are ahead for those of us who know Christ because we shall forever be with the Lord. Therefore, wherefore, we can encourage each other with those words. We understand here today, the Bible says, Deuteronomy 2, 3, ye have come past this mountain long enough, turn you northward. I don't want to pretend to that I can mention all the ways that God is speaking to us as a church today, but in faith, I trust and I pray that the Holy Spirit is communicating with your spirit. He's at least trying. And I hope that you're hearing him today. There are a few basic things I'll mention. First of all, those of you who are unsaved, God wants to save you. He wants to save you. John 3, 16, you've heard it before, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Salvation's for you. It's offered to you. It's available to you. Don't miss it, folks. If you have yet to trust Christ as your savior, do not let go of that one truth that God loves you and he wants to save you. It's you. And if you do not yet know Christ as your Savior, his plan of salvation is probably not your plan. You probably would try to earn your way to heaven. It's uncomfortable to most people. You can't earn salvation. You can never be, by the way, too evil for God to be able to save you. God can save anybody. God wants to save anybody. And I hope that you will let God help faith take that step. Let go, let go of the sin. Maybe there's a sin in your life. You say, if I, if I trust Christ, I'm gonna have to give up this sin. God will help you with that. Understand that when it comes to people, sometimes when it comes to relationships, God will bless you with more and better relationship than you could have ever imagined in your life. But have faith and trust Christ's finished work on the cross is able to save you. 
I'll say this as well. Some of you are saved, but you, uh, you have to take a face step. Some of you are just stagnant in your walk with God. Let go of some of those things. Some of you have been saved, but you have yet to be baptized. Let me encourage you to take that face step. We saw a baptism this morning. Praise the Lord for a little Roshin and taking that step of faith to be able to show the rest of the world, hey, I, I know Jesus as my Savior, and I want everybody else to know about him. It's been exciting to be able to see people baptized recently. Do you need to be baptized? We want to encourage you. Let's get you baptized. Take that step of faith. Some of you, God's led to open door, and I don't believe that's a mistake. God is at work, and he's gathering people to be able to serve him for the cause of the gospel. But some of you have even come through our Connecting Point class, and I'll just say, when do you want to become a member? We're ready for you to become a member. I hope that you're ready for God to help you to be a part of our community. For what purpose? To be a part of a country club? No, for this purpose, to share the gospel of Christ, to be able to preach Christ to others. Others, God has spoken to you about some step of faith, maybe sharing your testimony of salvation with a friend. Maybe it's inviting him or her to know Jesus Christ. Maybe it's budgeting so you're able to invest in eternity with your giving. Maybe it's getting involved in a ministry team. Maybe it's becoming the dad or mom or husband or wife or son or daughter or brother or sister that God wants you to be in your family or in your church family. God directs us that way. Sometimes God invites us out of our comfort zone so we can know him better. Perhaps you're thinking, I do a lot of complaining. I'm just going to start praising God. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Maybe God has spoken to you and whatever God has said to you seems like a big ask. God wants to do something. Maybe it's just too big. Here's a question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Will you have faith? Note our text one final time. Deuteronomy 2.3 says, You have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. It's time to move. Let's walk for God. Let's have faith for God. Let's get unstuck with our faith. Let's pray this morning. Would you stand where you are this morning as we pray? Lord, I thank you for the word of God. And I thank you for the invitation that you gave to your people in Deuteronomy 2, 3, and that you give to us right now as well to get unstuck from where we are, that you would help us to trust you and to move, to be able to follow you in the direction that you lead us to go. Lord, you have a direction for our church family. You have a direction for our individual homes and families. You have a direction for us in our community. Lord, I ask that you would help us right this moment to examine our own individual hearts and lives, that you might help us to see, to get a glimpse, at least a desire and a spark in our heart to know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us right now. And you want us to take steps of faith to follow you. Lord, this morning, for those who are here and they don't know Christ as their Savior, our prayer is that they would settle that with you. They might not be afraid, but they would take that step of faith to trust you, that they would be saved in the way that you prescribe through your holy word. Lord, for Christians right now, I pray that you would help us to get unstuck in whatever that way would be, that you would help us to humble ourselves before you, that you would lift us up, that you might help us to take those steps of faith, that you would lead us, no, how, no matter how inconsequential it may seem or insignificant, or maybe it seems very, very large to us, help us to have faith and trust you. Lord, for many of us in our lives, we've encompassed this mountain long enough, and you tell us, turn you northward. Help us to move and to follow you, because we know that when we have faith, faith is followed by action.